The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, good morning or uh, evening. I think it's early morning for me here in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. I'm Suzanne Kielsen. I'm a professor at, in engineering at Loyola University, Maryland. And for a number of years, I've been teaching introduction to engineering. I've taught in a special program over the summer, a concentrated four-week course for especially talented high school students at Johns Hopkins University, which is also in Baltimore. And I thought today I would share with you uh, some aspects of these courses and we can get into the parts of it that are most meaningful and potentially useful to you. So what you should see on your screen is we use a learning management system called Moodle, but of course you can use any system or no system at all to uh, store and uh, manipulate documents. Um, we have about a really more like a 13 week semester is the way that we are organized and of course there's never enough time in all of that. Um, so what you're seeing besides being in that Moodle uh, learning management system is this course is also I should say part of a special first year program a seminar style course so although it takes a fair bit of resources these courses are actually capped at 16 students and the students take two courses together believe it or not this introduction to engineering course is paired with a theology course all of our students take a common core of courses in the humanities and so on including in theology so it's an interesting pairing and maybe as we scroll down you'll see some things that relate to that um, the first thing I wanted to talk about are the two things I do right away in that first week of courses. One is called a uh, technical autobiography and that may be more meaningful to me and in the US perhaps as a way to find out what the experiences are that the students coming in have already had because many of our students are not exposed to engineering, uh, do not have that kind of background at all and um, are coming from diverse high schools with very different, again, kinds of exposure and training. So um, in that technical autobiography, I ask questions about what they have experienced and um, how they feel about using tools and machines, uh, doing experiments, have they done design contests, how do they use the computer and so on. So you can see here just uh, some basic questions that I ask. And what I have found over the years is actually very interesting. Again, I'd almost be interested cross-culturally if this holds that kind of, um, first of all, uh, experience and even respect for using tools, taking apart machines, the things that historically were part of engineering um, are not there so much. Um, also that students are not as experienced with the computer or even electronic gaming and so on as we think that they are. Um, so those have been some interesting insights. And then again, for us, the other insight is that um, the, the people who have influenced students the most have 
almost always been relatives uh, of one degree or another rather than any formal structure. So, you know, that's one interesting thing. The next thing I do really right on the first day is a paper tower contest. And um, that's always a fun, easy way, team building way to start off the year. And the other thing about it is you can see here, <clears throat> we can actually spend a fair bit of time talking about these different structures from a real engineering perspective so that it's not just sort of fun and games, so to speak, or you can take things that we might consider at a more elementary level and um, add to them. So in this case, what, what was added is that the materials are limited and everything has a cost. And so we begin to talk about the things that are the constraints for engineers in the real world. And so design is always done within constraints. And that is, of course, an important principle, but one that students early in their careers may not know as much about. Um, also, I have them compete in different categories. So some of the categories are to hold the most golf balls possible or to be the tallest. You certainly saw some that were pretty tall. Um, or to be the most aesthetically pleasing. And in that case, we can get into talking about things like the relationship of engineering to architecture. And I do spend a fair bit of time um, talking about the relationship of engineering to art and architecture. And that's um, a big push in the US now. We talk about STEM as science, technology, engineering, math, but there is also now STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, and the A is for the arts. And to explore a little bit more about what those relationships are. Um, so what I have found is part of that relation with the arts is that idea of hands-on work, the idea of open-ended problems, the blank page, which can be very frightening to students, um, and the idea of play, and also the idea that you need to um, waste and in play and in experimenting, there will be some waste of material and, you know, artists understand that, but very often uh, students want everything to be perfect right away. So um, that's our first week. I also like to bring in history, so the timeline of great engineering achievements. They pick their top ten choices, and we discuss those, create a timeline, and see the way that both mechanical, the mechanical universe, as I call it, and the electrical universe interact. And of course, the mechanical universe is much older for us. The electrical universe is much more recent and much more foreign to most of our students. Our program offers degrees in uh, mechanical concentration, materials concentration, 
and then in electrical and computer engineering concentrations. And this course tries to create some balanced experiences for both. Um, and we are interested in encouraging students to go into computer and electrical. Uh, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. Then uh, another centerpiece for me in thinking about engineering design and for the course is uh, Henry Petrovsky. And Henry Petrovsky is a civil engineer from Duke University. He has written a number of um, books popularizing engineering, which is, of course, a fairly rare thing. Um, and he writes regular columns in various magazines. So one activity that I uh, make a big deal about is this idea of the design of the paperclip and that there is kind of an evolution and taxonomy to the design of the paperclip and that it design is never ending. And so the students are challenged to redesign the paperclip and to write a five-page paper about that. So they have these resources, this uh, paper from Petrovsky, and sometimes they come up with wonderful ideas. I also <clears throat> show them, um, actually especially from Japan, there are many unique designs, paper clips that are in the shapes of animals and all kinds of things and I can buy them off the internet and hand them out. So uh, we make a big deal about this uh, paperclip redesign and that is one of these assignments where I actually um, also emphasize quite a bit writing, which is also a little bit unusual perhaps in engineering to emphasize writing. But that is an important piece of what we do. So here you can see the two essays about Petrovsky, the role of failure and paper clips. And we're, so we're getting into things about engineering design from maybe a sideways view. We talk about modes of failure. How do you analyze potential modes of failure? You don't know what, what might be the primary mode of failure. And again, there's a video Henry Petrovsky has, wonderful, from the mid-1980s, and we look at that and digest it. Um, how the materials and strength of materials plays into mechanical engineering, civil engineering, the evolution of designs, the things that we can do nowadays that we were not able to do before. He also has a very interesting idea about dead-end designs and why design is constantly changing and there are things that may be over-engineered. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about the role of safety, uh, safety factors, and how there's a trade-off between safety and uh, those other constraints of engineering of time, cost, performance, so that you want something to be light 
inexpensive, flexible, etc. Um, but of course, you want it to uh, not hurt anybody. And where do you put where do you put the money as an engineer into all of those different multiple constraints that you want to handle at the same time? So again, we're emphasizing what it's like to be an engineer as opposed to physics, chemistry, biology, mathematician, um, and that, that it is unique in these ways of design. Uh, so there you can see that project. And I do talk to them about writing clearly, incorporating uh, graphs into the writing, so on and so forth. We also, in conjunction with that work, Petrovsky's talking about failure modes, we talk about buckling. And um, in talking about buckling, we actually collect some data and I have the students graph the data and that is surprisingly uh, more difficult than we might think. So here are the data to just look at the idea of spaghetti of different diameters, so we have thin spaghetti, linguine is thinner than thin, and then angel hair pasta here is the thinnest. So we have different diameters, and we have um, different lengths of the... Uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, Somebody is asking, could you just zoom in a little bit? Oh, oh, sure. Sorry, I didn't. Um... How how's that? To yes. zoom in like that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the these are real data that our students took. It was very simple, and and it it's been a great experience. Um, we have a scale and these pieces of spaghetti. The students measure off different lengths, uh, three samples of each, and then just by pressing down on the top of these different lengths of spaghetti, uh, they get try and get some measurement in grams uh, because it's really the mass, how much force it takes, when that spaghetti begins to buckle. And the challenge for them is to take this table of data and to plot it and to see that um, as the spaghetti gets shorter, the buckling strength becomes much, much higher. And I, this is a fundamental mechanical engineering principle. Um, it also depends on the radii of your beam. So we can get into a lot of mechanical engineering about beams and beam buckling. Again, for an introductory course, hopefully I just want to put it in their heads and then when they get to the materials or um, mechanical engineering analysis, you know, they can look back and remember this. And they have to find the power law that relates these numbers to each other. So that's the challenge I leave them with. And maybe surprising, maybe not, it really was challenging for the students. They took this data in um, 20 minutes and it took them quite a bit longer to really then analyze the data and, and kind of get out of it. The power law, what's going on, what's buckling, 
um, that there's compression and tension and kind of all of those questions. So I was pleased this was the first year I had them do this. And again, the idea of presenting data, creating graphs and charts, we were able to discuss that as well. Um, so I'm just highlighting a few things here in this course as we go through that. Um, again, I talk about writing history and um, society in engineering. This actually came from materials from quite a while ago uh, where I spent a couple of summers, a couple of weeks with David Billington at Princeton University. Again, he is a civil engineer and he is quite interested in how the politics and again, these other non-technical constraints work on engineering. And so I created this with help and based on his materials where we start off by looking at how engineering can impact changes in landscape. This is obviously back in the uh, 1820s. Both of these, this Thomas Cole is painting the east coast of the U.S. and of course the steamship comes in. So this is a very American centric kind of view and looking at the relation among essentially civil engineering, mechanical engineering, machines that are moving through the structures over, through, under, etc. networks can be thought of as spatially distributed uh, representation for electrical engineering because even a circuit is a network as well as power grids and so on. So we've got civil, mechanical, electrical and then processes as being representative of chemical engineering and how all of that kind of combines if we don't have the chemical engineering, we don't have the uh, the iron, we can't make the iron bridges and so on. Um, and then going back to these questions of design, structure, shape. I um, The George Washington Bridge is one that I focus on coming from the New York area and the history of it, the politics of it, uh, also at that same historical moment in the U.S. there was the famous um, Tacoma Narrows bridge failure and so talking about what happened in suspension bridge design and the need to stiffen the walkway, all of that I'm able to present in <clears throat> a first year course. So it, we actually cover quite a bit of ground, as you can see. And again, talking about the mutual impacts um, of society, politics, on engineering, technology, vice versa. The idea of structures as symbols for countries and societies. And then I'll quickly go through this. What happens with networks? This is John D. Rockefeller's um, standard oil processing plant. So what happens um, in the U.S., again in particular this is U.S. focused with steamboats, their boiler explosions. Mark Twain tells a lot of stories about that. Uh, so this is intended as a real mix of our emphasis on a core curriculum, the humanities and social sciences, 
and how they interact with engineering, which I think is a little unique because usually engineers get trained in very narrow technical ways. I always thought that these two networks are quite interesting to look at and analyze that the railroad network in the US has really atrophied so that our Amtrak network looks like this now. And I try and prompt the students to think about why this is so, what the rise of the private automobile has done to railroads, and whether this is good or bad. Uh, what do we need in terms of infrastructure, public works? Um, and so it sets off a, a good conversation. And then also the fact that, of course, the US is uh, 3,000 miles <clears throat> across, and most folks would fly nowadays rather than using the railroad. Um, assuming they can manage that. Um, and again, a, a fair bit of history. We run through, uh, hard to remember how exciting all of this was back in the 20s and the 30s, the large structures. Um, and then what happens out west in the US, and, and you see then we can make a, um, segue into talking about the electrical, the rise of the electrical universe, the rise of the integrated circuit, the microchip, Silicon Valley, the computer, uh, and how those things have really transformed our society and created the need for other kinds of networks and understanding of networks. Um, this cover is wonderful to talk about because it combines bridges, uh, shipping, uh, rail, trucks, cars, trucks, cars, airplane. So you've got all of this coming together. This is in Newark, New Jersey at the port of Newark. And um, again, seeing how the infrastructure interconnects. So in particular, I then focus on Othmar Amin, who built most of the bridges in the New York area. And he's an interesting fellow. Lindenthal was his mentor, but he then fights Lindenthal about where and how the bridges should be built. Um, and also his understanding of the aesthetic of bridges. And so I ask students to go out and find new interesting pictures of structures. Uh, this idea of structural art, Christian Men, Robert Maillard, the Swiss School, is something that David Billington really emphasized. So again, there's that connection of civil engineering in particular to architecture and to art. And um, these new designs of cable stayed bridges are interesting to look at and compare to the more traditional bridges. Um, and again, kind of why that happened as it did. So enough time on, on that. That PowerPoint presentation is quite extensive and can take up quite a bit of time. Um, I th and I go back to it throughout the semester or, or try to. So there's Othmar Amin, an interesting case study. I actually take a shift here to bring up some things in mathematics that I think are important 
and that students don't always get. Charles and Ray Eames, um, again, these things are a bit older perhaps and the students are often surprised. Uh, this video never fails to get a big reaction from the students. Charles and Ray Eames were designers. They designed chairs and other everyday objects and they created this famous video um, called The Powers of Ten. Uh, I'm not going to show the different videos that I have here. If you're interested, of course, I can send you links to all of this uh, material. Anyway, very, very famous, created back in the 1970s, never fails to stun the students and what it does is it zooms out by orders of 10 and zooms back in and even though it is from the 1977 I think uh, not that much of what is said about physics biology and the scale of things has changed at some level it has not changed talking about that and the scale of things allows me to then talk about um, estimation, which is what Fermi problems are. Uh, we'll make it a little bigger, hopefully. So Fermi problems are named after Enrico Fermi, and there's a wonderful little book called Guestimation. And the idea is how can you calculate things on the back of an envelope? what are order of magnitude estimates. Things that maybe we as professionals take for granted that we know how to do, but we forget how implicit that is and that our students may not have had those experiences. We need to provide those experiences. So powers of 10, Fermi problems, plenty of room at the bottom is the text of Richard Feynman's very famous 1959 talk about nanotechnology. All of this is, and including dimensional thinking, is looking at um, orders of magnitude, scales of things, shapes of things, and so on. So what Feynman does back in 59 in this talk is to give you a sense of how much can be stored at the atomic level. Um, in this PowerPoint that I put together about dimensional reasoning and as you can see again I guess I'm always bringing in the arts uh, I bring in some of the latest stuff that's been on Mandelbrot that's the fractal Mandelbrot set um, how do we measure so some really uh, fundamental things here what are primitives units of measure so we get into things that are traditional for introduction to engineering. Um, I try and explain to them though that what are the take-home messages, units matter. This is another classic case study of uh, failure. Um, and again, units matter. <laughs> Cats aren't bananas, aren't puppies, units matter. So that's our cute take home message here. And obviously though, it's a very important one for um, professional engineers. And I like to have the students feel like they're being brought into uh, kind of the, the profession early on, that they're members of this community. Um, And then we can talk about proportionalities, things that are dimensionless numbers, linear scaling, 
um, the importance of scale. So this is about surface tension. Uh, how scale matters in thinking about, so I ask which of these is a real photo of a ship and, and which are models. And this, these boats are models, this is real. And although it may be hard to see, some of the things like the way the water sprays and the scale of things is, is off. Um, so that, and there are other ways you can kind of tell that these are probably models, but this idea of scaling is such a fundamental insight into nature and therefore into design and the limits of our design. So things like how heat's going to radiate out, how area to volume vary. So it has a number, again, of consequences for biological design. You can't dissipate the energy through the surface area. So we're probably, although certainly the dinosaurs existed, there, there are certain limits to biological design. And then going from those kind of scaling things to a brief mention of what goes on in um, fractals and how Sometimes in the scale of things, uh, when things are fractal, we lose a sense of scale so that it's really hard to tell which one of these is microscopic and which one is macroscopic. So actually this picture, the gray uh, one here, that's actually a view from a satellite. And this is a microscopic view of pores. Okay, so again, a little bit of a whirlwind tour. The theme here is about scaling, dimensions, estimation, I would say. Those were the themes for that week. Um, Okay, this is the way we have students um, submit their assignments and again we have other things going on in the class. Um, just one other, so now here I shift to talking about engineering drawing and also graphical communication and putting that in the context of, believe it or not, engineering ethics. And in particular, we talk about the Challenger disaster, which is a good case study. There's a lot of uh, material available for that. And so another person I like to talk to the students a lot about is um, Edward Tufty. If you're not familiar with him, he's published about four or five books. Uh, the most famous is one called the, um, the Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And I've extracted this chapter where he looks at how data is presented uh, from the engineers trying to stop the launch of the Challenger disaster. Uh, prior that evening of January 26, 1986, uh, there were some engineers who were trying to convince NASA management to not launch, um, and they did anyway. And then the nub, the bottom line of this, is this figure right here. And I'll try and remember to make these things a little bigger. 
the Challenger was launched, the temperature was down here, January 27th. So that was the day of the launch. On <clears throat> um, or 27th, the launch was on the 28th. Okay, so there's our info. Anyway, the temperature was here. All the prior shuttle launches were over here. Now, when I include all of these data points, the axis here is something we're calling O-ring damage index. So they did not do this at the time. They didn't have the time to create a chart like this, to create an index like the O-ring damage index. But if you're to plot the correct things against each other, creating this O-ring damage index versus temperature, and including all of the data, including these points here that are zeros. In other words, you might not want to include that at all. You might just look at these points here where there was damage. And if you look at those points where there was damage only, you might say, oh, it doesn't seem too temperature dependent. But if you kind of take all of the data and even with your eye you create some kind of regression, you can be more convinced that maybe we shouldn't be launching at uh, such low temperatures. So that's his point. That's Edward Tufte's point, is about the proper display of data, about putting all data on the graph, not selectively um, filtering the data, how other graphical methods are not as helpful to presenting the data, and he even has a little bit of critique of Richard Feynman again, who famously took a cup of cold ice water with a C-clamp and a bit of rubber and showed how the rubber lost its resiliency. But what Tufty points out is that in a proper scientific experiment, um, you really need to have comparisons. So it's less resilient than what? that what he should have really done was to create a true experimental design with measurements at two temperatures. And again, these may be things that uh, we know from experience and gaining expertise. I'm always trying to find ways of how we can impress these things upon our students. Okay, I want to take a little bit of time, so I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. We actually, at around the midterm, week six, we switch to talking about the electrical universe um, and computer organization. And Again, I think there's always a challenge in presenting that to students, getting them, it, it's a little more abstract. The things that I do, uh, I do soldering kits so they get that exposure and they love the hands-on stuff and it's a great way to have kind of low-key interaction with the students, um, low risk environment, no exams or quizzes, and again, at least our students have not been exposed typically, some have, to things like soldering. So they do the soldering. Also, uh, I want them to experience programming. And again, we might think that students know this or experts in this or whatever, but 
far from the truth from what I've found. There's a wonderful little um, free program called Scratch, and it's from MIT. It's just a web-based programming environment, and I have them create the game of Pong. So, you know, that was one of the earliest computer games. They have to write their own version in Scratch. And again, if you're interested, I can share that Scratch link with you. Um, but it, it's free and available from MIT. So they're getting into soldering. They've done programming. And then I give them a digital logic challenge. And I think, let me take a minute and I'm going to open up that circuit and we will um, not making it, let's see, we can make it bigger. So the challenge here is the following. Actually, um, get uh, first year students to play around and create um, a full adder and a half adder talking about logic gates. This stuff the students love and we're able to go to a fair bit. Uh, the final challenge here in the Logic Circuits Lab is that they have to um, have three sensors, so three inputs, and two motors, so two outputs, and Uh, so here, again, are some links and references, some stuff about Boolean algebra, the full adder, half adder. They have to have uh, three inputs, two outputs, and create a little combinatorial logic circuit that would act as a light-following robot out of basic NAND gates. So we do we do spend time getting into the electronics as well. Programming, soldering, digital logic. Um, I do have the students read from Donald Norman's Design of Everyday Things. We talk about a company called IDEO, I-D-E-O. They're one of the world's great um, design firms. They designed the computer mouse. And there's a wonderful little video of them redesigning the shopping cart. And so again, here we're going back to questions of product design, um, steam, so there's art and aesthetics in this, idea of feedback, affordances, visibility, feedback, you know, so how people know what the action is that's been taken, that it's been performed properly, that there is mapping of control problems and all of those kinds of questions of design to make design intuitive. Um, so those are the basic principles. We talk about mapping, feedback, affordances, constraints, physical constraints, that prevent users from doing the wrong thing. 
Um, and again, the idea of what is good design, what is bad design, and how humans interact with their objects in the environment. So we, whoops, sorry, we, we talk about that here. Here's IDEO redesign of the shopping cart. Um, and I then bring that into the question of technological aids for people with disabilities. And um, this becomes another highlight for the class. The students have to go out, write a paper, where they're looking at the history, design constraints of some aid for people with disabilities. And so we look at these categories of issues, mobility, hearing, vision, um, whether these things are walkers. And again, there are different, just the range of designs uh, so that the word walker covers so much, the range of designs in hearing aids, um, how aesthetic plays a role in the consumer market. Um, again, the range of designs, braille keyboards, readers, so that, you know, the design challenge here is you're reading off of a curved surface. The idea that in universal design, when we design for a group, um, all of a sudden these things become desirable to markets that we haven't even thought of yet. And um, again, universal design, you're designing maybe for a sub-market or a sub-group but the things that you design all of a sudden have a lot more implication than you thought that they did. The students, I think, really enjoy um, thinking about engineering as design, thinking about engineering as being very human in its impact and that's what makes it unique is that it's not the common image of the abstract mathematical um, divorced from human kind of thing that it really is about solving problems for people here are principles that relate to things like feedback, affordance, mapping, so human-machine interaction. Uh, these principles of universal design also came from the redesign of living spaces so that people could live more independently, longer. Uh, and this came out of a group in North Carolina. So those are our principles of universal design that, you know, we discuss. And again, the, the range of things where it applies is huge. Um, our students go on and then in senior year, they do a senior design project. One of the biggest failings, I think, is that they kind of forget everything they learned before. And when they do the design project, they forget about things like calculate the actual forces that are needed to interact with the objects. So if you're older, you know, how do you un screw the top to a jar. Um, what are the, how does that become technical design specs? So, 
so. Um, we, again, assistive technologies, they do some background research on that. Um, we've got the digital logic and the Pong. They also take apart a computer mouse and they have a little project um, to look at the history of the computer mouse and to answer some questions. We get into a request for proposals project uh, where they break out into teams and um, here, is, here are the two problem statements. So I've actually constrained this assignment. <clears throat> Previously, it had been the culmination of the, the class, and it was kind of go out there, see a problem, do brainstorming, propose solutions, do an oral presentation. Um, and, and there were good things about that approach. This year, I'm trying a somewhat different approach where the two problems are quite specified, as hopefully you can see here. And um, again, the first problem, which is the one that all of the students this year decided to work on, is how do you have a method or device to improve drug taking compliance rate of patients? So again, that kind of shows uh, with my interest in assistive technologies and the human interaction with technology. The second problem statement is in that STEAM, that arts area, that a sculptor wants to create a piece. He wants to create a random process and design a practical mechanism for a random event that happens on average once a year to move his art piece. Um, but the students all decided to work on this first problem in teams and um, we will see how, <laughs> how that goes this year. They're going to be presenting um, in middle of December on this. And this is a very real problem uh, and one with a lot of, frankly, market potential. And it, it should prove interesting. Um, so we, again, kind of try and tie together at this point in the semester um, a little bit of a critique of stuff, all this stuff that engineers make, the manufacturing processes, and ideas both here, how will we make things, and here in biomimicry and some of these brief articles and case studies, you can see McDonald's, the plastic shells, e-waste, uh, creative destruction is about um, recycling cars. Um, so how cell phones have leaped over generations of infrastructure, biomimicry, uh, using ideas inspired from nature, so on and so forth. So uh, at the end here, I'm bringing it up to kind of mod what I think of as modern issues of sustainability, appropriate technology, and new ways of thinking of design from what we say cradle to cradle, not even cradle to grave. And hopefully they can end the semester on kind of a high note. We started by talking about engineering failure but here talking about kind of new exciting ways, actually new exciting ways of thinking about solving problems in the world. So I think I'm kind of out of time. 
um, happy to take questions now um, or after, provide my email, uh, whatever you want. Hopefully this gave you maybe some ideas of things that you can use in your courses or areas of engineering that uh, you might want to explore further for yourself and for your courses. There are a couple of questions. Okay, great. Um, do Maybe I need to... Open. You can open them if you want. Let's see if that works for me. I'm not... I'm not... I'll do that. <laughs> How can engineers develop their design skills in order to help the society? Um, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, maybe if you just read the questions, I, I can't, I can't seem to expand the little window there. So, how do we develop design skill? I mean, that is the big question. It's part of that. How do you bottle innovation? Um, I think play, I want to go back to that idea of play, allowing the students in low risk, safe environments to, to waste, to play, to use their hands as well as their heads. Um, so some of that might be thought of strictly as trial and error. The final feedback link that I think is missing sometimes is, okay, we've done trial and error. Um, you've built a nice uh, tower or whatever it is, but let's go back and calculate now after the fact. And let's see also if we can analyze what we did and extract certain rules. Um, there are a lot of books and a lot of material out there about the design process, managing groups, going from problem statement to brainstorming to specifications to prototyping. Um, and I do have some materials and presentations on that, but, you know, the real thing is I, I think we do need to roll up our sleeves and play a bit in the sandbox to get students to really think about design and have the time and the low risk to do that. 